I have adoption to sonship. I have the authority vested in me by Jesus Christ and that he hands us sovereign power so that we too can rule and reign in the new millennium, in the millennial kingdom, which is coming very, very soon. In fact, when we spend time in heaven, we are going to be in a state of training. Not only do we arrive for the Bema seat, the awards, we will get to hear Jesus Christ actually teach the Torah in the gardens of heaven. And uh, a little bit like when uh, for years and years, I've run my own companies, as you all know, and I have been on um, seminars, weekend getaways to go and get rah-rah sessions with other companies. Uh, I've always been a part of brand building and, and um, you know, uh, corporate teamsmanship building, team womanship building. You know, we've always gone on these um very intense uh, two three four five day sometimes conferences and when we arrive there's always a state of excitement we get um told that there's an awards ceremony coming <laughs> we also which is probably you know when we arrive in heaven i think jesus is going to do it in reverse so he'll give us our awards straight away but you know it could be that we're in heaven for seven years as the earth goes through tribulation and then the great tribulation. It has to happen in that order because, you know, there is a state of complete chaos when millions and millions and millions, if not a billion, uh, and we know this from the formula that's contained in the Bible of how many people exactly leave the earth in the rapture. And there's programs on this on our channel and you can follow that formula. Uh, obviously, we don't know the exact number because that number varies, but there's a formula for working it out. And we arrive in heaven, and the Bema seat is a place where we get awarded for what we did for the kingdom. And we're all together, the dead in Christ, who rose first, and then we who are alive and left. We are caught up in the clouds, and then we arrive in heaven with our Lord Jesus Christ to be with him forever, forevermore. We'll never be apart, we're assured. By Apostle Paul. Now, what makes this fascinating is that uh, we are in heaven for for training. We're in heaven as the the elect, the elected, to go through what Jesus Christ requires for us. And I don't know if you know this, but with conferencing, when you do conferencing in the corporate world, or when you uh, go from satellite offices all the way to corporate head office. You normally arrive, they normally go off site. So you go to a hotel or you go to someplace fancy. Sometimes it's Disney World, you know, Florida, or, or someplace really astounding, a beautiful and amazing place. Because what corporations want to do is they want to both make you feel excited, that you are part of a, something very special, and uh, they also want to reward you for being a part of the organization. Uh, I was part of the Virgin when they, uh, Virgin Cola, when uh, Richard Branson came to South Africa to launch Virgin Cola in the 90s. He uh, took on a company called, um, uh, it was Rick Melville's company, uh, and I think it was Moonlight Productions, if I'm not mistaken. But this company, what they did was they organized for Branson to arrive in South Africa. And then Branson was toured to Lissetti. Uh, we were on the bus with him going to Lissetti, uh, which is sort of a township um, recreated area out near Witkorpen. Uh We were then taken to Soweto in a bus and did a tour of the shanty town. Uh, we also landed up at Witkorpen Center and also one or two other farms where there were barbecues and Richard Branson did his traditional uh, trademark throwing people in the pool uh, stint stunt that he always was involved with. And um, I did a pitch myself and one of my um, employees of, of my company, we did a pitch to, to Branson on the train to um, John Devereaux and Richard Branson. And it was the first time that anybody had actually pitched to him in a bus 
because <laughs> he didn't realize who we were. He thought we were part of the Virgin group, but we were actually uh, outsiders uh, enjoying what was going on. We were very uh, smartly able to, with a, a friend of mine by the name of Tash, Tasha Natasha, she was able to get us. Uh, she and Zesty competed against each other to try to see who was the first one who could get us with an audience with Richard Branson. And that was really interesting because we got on this bus, we pitched to Branson and, and Richard said, you know, uh, and when he didn't heard my name, he said, well, that's an interesting name to have to be to have if you're someone in the film industry, which is one of the industries that I'm very involved with. And I soon realized that one of the things that I was experiencing with Branson and his Virgin team um, was was that we were having exactly one of these conferences, you know? So what happens at one of these conferences, and again, we've seen many of these things unfold in places like Hamilton Island or in the Fiji Islands or Mauritius or Seychelles, you know, lots and lots of people all come, they, they fly in and it's very exciting, you know, uh, and you settle in and the very next day, uh, the excitement begins and it starts and for a whole week or 10 days or whatever that you're on this island or at this conference facility, uh, a number of things happen. So you've got time to yourself to enjoy the touristy sights, the touristy um, uh, beauty areas, the beautiful areas that are on these places. Uh, for instance, um, the White Sundays, the White Sundays, the White Sundays, as I call it, but the Wood Sundays, uh, which is in Hamilton Island, uh, Hammond Island, uh, when we went there, which is on the east coast of Australia. Um, and it's exciting. You know, it's really beautiful. You you know, the meals are amazing, the, 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 the romance of being there, you know, but, but you're there to also do things. You know, because these corporations don't just fly you in. They don't just expense pay everything for you to hang around and do nothing. And I think that's what's going to happen in heaven. We arrive in heaven. There's a lot of praising and worshipping of our Lord Jesus Christ, which we love. And we meet him and he teaches the Torah and all of those things. But we also have, you know, and we get to see the sights of heaven, uh, the cube of heaven, the 12 gates, uh, the uh, the extraordinary because uh, it's the size of the United States, you know, uh, as a cube, uh, which could not land on the Earth if uh, if the Earth uh, was of the um, uh, if the Earth was the way we're told by uh, Bill Nye. <laughs> so we that's all that's all I'm going to say at that point. But what happens is we arrive in this glorious place of glory, and we we know what's happening on the earth. We know that there are new brothers and sisters that are going to come into the kingdom or are now even now coming into the kingdom. There's this huge amount of chaos that's happening on the earth. And, uh, and this figure arrives, this antichrist who now shows himself. He appears. It's the only time he's now allowed to appear because the, the two restrainers have been removed off the face of the earth. Now, there's the restrainer A and restrainer B. There's the it and the he, and we can see almost very blatantly and clearly that there are these two restrainers. And the restrainer is not, I had first thought it used to be the Holy Spirit, but it turns out it's not just the Holy Spirit. It turns out that, um, you know, the Holy Spirit, of course, continues to remain behind on the earth as well. Uh, the Holy Spirit is everywhere because God is everywhere. So. When we are removed off the face of the earth, the Holy Spirit is still on the earth. So that doesn't make any sense that the Holy Spirit would, uh, as the restrainer, be removed off the face of the earth to leave the rest of humanity in the doldrums in, in jeopardy. I don't think that's possible. I think God uh, has made a plan for that. So whether it's Michael the Archangel which it's very possible, and his um, warring holy angels that keep evil at bay, or whether it's Satan himself. Satan himself could actually be one of the restrainers because he's terrified that the 
uh, earth comes into tribulation uh, and he knows then his time is really short and he's extremely angry because he also knows that once Jesus Christ arrives back on the earth with all the saints in tow and defeats the 200 million man-woman army that's built up against him. After that, there's the thousand years of millennial reign in which Satan has absolutely no say in the matter, except that he comes out at the very end of that thousand years in the Gog and Magog, Gog Magog uh, war and battle. Uh, kind of a reverse evangelism where everyone who's around at the time for that thousand years calls into question whether there is actually a Hazazel trapped underneath the ground somewhere. They can't believe it. It becomes very much the youngsters that are given a chance, the, the hundreds of millions, billions, perhaps even children that now are on the earth living out their lives um, to make a decision themselves whether they want Jesus Christ or Hasatan. They don't believe that there is a Hasatan. There is a reverse evangelism that's at, alive and at work on the earth at that time. And... Um, so we get to the end of that. There's that final rearing of its ugly head, Hasatan, and then he's, you know, the final judgment. And at that final judgment, that's when everything is resolved. You know, God tries those who are still yet and alive and are along with everyone else um, for that final judgment, the great white throne room judgment, which occurs between Jerusalem and Elam, uh, which is the seat of government in the Millennial Kingdom. And Jesus Christ, along with his elected saints, then runs and rules and reigns the earth. But what's fascinating about this, the, the more we know about it, the more we realize that our tour of heaven is a tour de force. We're there for a very short space of time, but while we are there, we can see the horror that's happening down on the earth. And we are called into a war room praying. We are called to warfare through prayer. We are called to uh, intercede for our brothers and sisters, new brothers and sisters that are coming into the kingdom on earth. And we get to see the inner workings of the kingdom. We get to see God daily. We get to experience who God really is. We get to know what Jesus is all about. We get to understand the millennial kingdom before we arrive in the millennial kingdom. We basically are in training. Uh, we get to experience from a heavenly perspective what God is after for the new thousand years. Methuselah lived 969 years. So we having a thousand years of life in a glorified body is because it allows us to travel between earth and heaven is very much a, a reality. We know this by virtue of evidence, a fact pattern that appears biblically. You know, even in a broken state, the world continued to produce human beings that were living close to the thousand year mark. So that thousand years, again, the fact that Methuselah lived 969 years, tells us uh, very clearly that um, the length of time, the length and period of time in which Hasatan appears on the earth is 30, 30 years, 31 years. And, um, and that's going to be the time of influence that Lucifer is going to have in that millennial kingdom period. And we see this again reoccurring yeah, from a multitude of perspectives, from the perspectives of templates. And I'm one to speak about templates all the time. There are so many templates biblically. And if you follow the templates, you know how the templates work. You can actually see the three raptures based on the three templates of the three harvests, the wheat, the barley, the grape. Uh, we see the three temple times. We see the... The, the feasts plus the extra feasts. We see the, we see the, um, the templates that occur in relation to the 613 Levitical laws. We see how those templates move throughout the Bible. We also see how Jesus Christ embodies not only man, but he also embodies complete and total authority and dominion as appointee of the throne room 
of Yudhe Vave, we see that the templates reoccur again and again biblically. You know, it's a very powerful way of both understanding the chronological viewpoint from God's eternal perspective of the earth, but also how things will play out in the millennial kingdom and then in the new heaven and in the new earth right after the great white throne room judgment. So with that all in mind, I wanted to just say that our foray into heaven is is not just to go and see the sights and to get to see the truth of it all. Remember, mankind immediately after the first rapture will have their first huge eye-opening moment that there is a God, right? Up until now, all of humanity has been saying, well, if God was real, why doesn't he just show up? Many would convert that way. Many souls would be saved. Well, the rapture is that very event. God is the new rapture. The new rapture is God. You know, they weren't ready for Jesus Christ. They didn't see him coming when the Jews saw Yeshua Mashiach, Yeshua, arrive on a donkey. They didn't get him. Even when he was standing right in front of the Pharisees, the Sadducees, they didn't get that he was Jesus Christ. He was the anointed Hamashiach. He was the great God from heaven in embodied form here on earth. They didn't see it. So the new Jesus is the rapture. They don't see him coming. The rapture's coming. In fact, we can see all the signs. Those who are truly the elect know that Jesus is the truth. He is the way, the life, and he is coming. He is coming for us, right? 145 scriptures that all prove the rapture. The templates prove the rapture. We can see from Revelation 4, the removal of the church. We can see from Revelation 5 onwards that these multitudes, there are three, appear biblically. Zechariah, which I call Revelation 1 and Revelation, which is Revelation 2. We see the templates very, very clear that these three different multitudes are the three harvests, right? And while this is not a discussion on the harvests and the three raptures, the church, the 144,000, and then the overcomers who are not the martyrs, but the overcomers who are able to escape, keep themselves uh, in hiding and escape the beast system throughout those seven years and specifically the last three and a half years, uh, not to be confused with the 144,000 who make their way to and stay hiding in Petra. We, we know there are three three harvests and the last one being 91 days before the second coming and for the believers who don't believe in the rapture or believe that it's a mid or a post tribulation rapture uh, you're all correct each and every one of you right unless you're a denominational believer because denominational believers continue to have the wool over their eyes they can't see they cannot see um that they are caught in certain deceptions. It's one of the reasons why you shouldn't be in a denomination. And I try not to, under any uh, circumstances, uh, speak uh, against denominations, but denominations are problematic, very problematic. Uh, They all are hiding some of the truth or they work through prophets. And these prophets keep them from knowing the truth. This is why I always say get rid of a prophet. If you have someone, you know, a he or a she that's telling you to believe something a certain way or that the mark is something else in the future, it's, it's a lie. That's, that's the deception. But they can't see it because they're not following Jesus Christ directly. Right? Jesus is the way, the truth and the life. There is nothing else. Jesus is it. Right? And we, when we don't understand that, when we don't focus on Christ as our absolute, as our focus, we make mistakes. You know, denominations are dangerous, D for D. They are extremely dangerous. 